Hello and welcome to Desert Island 2, the triumphant return after a, a small break. Now, the, I am Conrad and with me is, as usual, Will. Hello. And our guest today is Al from the Diddly Down podcast, which is a quite a popular podcast. I think I remember seeing it as, um, I saw it as the, like, the um, new and noteworthy on the iTunes, the TV and film. Oh, that cost a fortune, so I'm glad that worked. <laughs> I may have just made that up. We, we, we haven't paid anyone for anything ever. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, before, Hello, we get into, before we get into the list, just, um, we always like to ask our guests about, you know, the, the background. Obviously, you have been on the Diddly Dum podcast, which is quite a new podcast. I mean, uh-huh, how, yeah. how did you get involved in that? Uh, that was a bit of a weird one because um, the three of us, because it's um, myself, um, the Rev, and Doc Doc Hume, um, we'd been writing um, kind of litigious emails and things to um, to the Blue Box podcast, which is the the Starburst Doctor Who uh, podcast. <clears throat> well, I think those two have been writing emails to them for longer than I had because I'd kind of drifted into it by accident because I which is I, I I came into it another way around and we were having these these letters read out until it reached the point where J.R. Southall who's a lovely fellow um, and basically um, one of the main if not the main Doctor Who correspondents for Starburst so uh, invited us on as guests I think during a week when everyone else was down with scrofula or something so they couldn't <laughs> do it so we we uh, we filled in, and, and um, it was nerve wracking and more successful than we were expecting. And uh, he suggested that we might like to uh, maybe set up our own our own podcast. And we undenied for about a week, and then sort of thought, yeah, that would be an absolutely yeah. terrific idea. Yeah. So so that was that, and then we we went on to do that. But I been doing other stuff sort of before that and the guys themselves had also Rev and Doc had both been running blogs and it, I think ultimately it was JR's ploy to get us to stop writing to him and I have stopped writing to the Blue Box podcast because I I follow the hints but the other two haven't <laughs> <laughs> so anyway uh, um, shall we get onto your list yeah go on then because yeah. it's quite uh, so yeah. your, your first choice is maybe not <laughs> such an obvious choice uh huh um, it's a Hartnell story, and it, it's in fact one of the. It's the first partially missing story that anyone's picked. Oh right. So anyway, it's the Myth Makers. It is the Myth Makers. Very glad you're pleased with yourself. I suppose I should be grateful for standing here to trust like a chicken, ready to have my throat cut. No one mentioned cutting throat. No, they did. I, I've got to be honest because before before we sort of go any further, I should probably explain that I've I've picked this selection not necessarily because they're my they're they're my all-time favorite uh doctor who stories or or they're the best ones but i worked on the basis that if i was on a desert island because um it's the whole kind of desert island disc thing if i was on a desert island and these were the only ones that i'd have to watch then i might as well go for something that would actually personally um be beneficial for me to watch you know when when i was there during that time for whatever reason because it might remind me of parts of my life and things like that because i i'm guessing that there's no hope of rescue and eventually you're just going to walk in the sea and be eaten by sharks is that kind of how it goes yeah that's kind of how it goes well, probably yeah oh, there were flying sharks like in the christmas carol yeah oh oh that'd be good or oh, planet of the dead of course yeah so um yeah so well this this one the myth makers was um i i uh, so some of the some of the selections that i've made I, I haven't deliberately tried to be obscure i've gone for sort of like stories that really wow you know got me um because um apart from the diddly dumb podcast i run a, a, a well i write a blog i run it with somebody else who will probably come up because i've asked for permission so maybe i get to do a bit of naming a bit of this a sort of ongoing mystery of, of someone who hasn't had a name up till now um but i do a blog with a um a fellow called the him uh, in which i'm known as the me and we've been watching doctor who through from its from the, you know from the very first one in order from the pilot which of course no one's ever done before and none of the guests that you've had on here have even done that so it's a it's a remarkably original approach to watching doctor who that uh, i'm surprised no one's ever thought of really because it's a bit like Monroe back here. um and um it's um it was interesting because when we hit the myth makers 
because the recon delta, as I've sort of referred to it, where, you, where you're going through all the reconstructions, it's, it's really heavy going if it's just audio. And often, kind of like, if you can dig them out on YouTube if they haven't been taken down and you watch these sort of grainy, copied from loose canon reconstruction videos and they're all wobbly and they're all over the place and you can't quite work out what's been said. And there's only, I think, two production stills that even survived. There were no telesnaps done, so it's all audio. And the reconstruction comes largely from that. But the Myth Makers itself, it's phenomenal because it's really, really funny. And it's very entertaining. But also, um, it comes at a time that's, um, that's really weird because um, at, at, at this point back in 1960, uh, 1965, of course, you, you, you wouldn't have had um, repeats, which is part of the reason why so many of them got junked. Uh, so many of the stories got junk because they weren't going to be repeated. And um, and this is a really, really clever one because the Myth Makers itself works on the basis that not only are you going to have been paying enough attention to what's been happening previously, you're going to have enough of a... You're going to have enough of a, of, of a classical education that you're almost ahead of the Doctor and, um, and Stephen and Vicky within it and that you know what's, what's coming. Going, what's going yes. to happen, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because the one first... that wouldn't work on telly nowadays, really. Well, it... uh, I mean, obviously, a lot of people know about the Trojan horse, but, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's not as, you know, less people have a classical education nowadays. Yeah, we, we haven't got we haven't got annuals filling this sort of things in. You know, the the informative aspect of it isn't there. And um, what can Achilles learn, isn't did on his holidays <laughs> yeah. in the old annuals. Yeah, that Bradley Pitt. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's just oh, yeah, all of that stuff. It's not it's not around. So anyway, the whole the whole thing's really funny. It's really hilarious. It's like a carry on film. And then in episode four, everyone dies, and it's brutal. <laughs> It's it's really hideous, and I, I think that probably John Wilde was, I don't know, he must have got migraines or something, or he'd be in terribly bad mood, because it's really, really nasty. And all these people that you've grown to care about and enjoy, they are actually doomed. And, and as it's going on, although you're laughing, you, there's still the brick wall ahead. It's like, you know, everyone's in the car having a terrific time, and they're, it's almost like a party. But at that point in their future, it's a fixed point in time it's going to hit a wall. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a bit gruesome. And whatever the doctor does to attempt to avoid this, it doesn't work. And it just keeps, it just steers them back towards the wall. Um, and they're not getting out of it. And it, and it, and it ends with, I mean, you know, spoilers. Um, I don't know, but it was, no, I won't tell you how it ends. Go and listen to it. It's amazing. Yeah. It's absolutely astounding. And they tried to rebottle the lightning, uh, later on with the gunfighters, which is much, much better than its reputation says, because it's got the same structure, as the, as, um, as the myth makers in that it's three episodes of, um, of kind of knockabout comedy. Um, and then one Everyone episode, dies. yeah, leading up to the tragedy. But unfortunately that time round, nobody cares because it's just a bunch of bad American accents that don't quite work <laughs> leading to a 20 second, well, leading to a gunfight that's longer than the actual gunfight itself would have been. So that's bizarre. I don't know. Yeah. So the myth makers, gentlemen, what, what, what do you think of it? Well, I, haven't, I haven't seen it. So. <laughs> well, it's, from, what, from what I've seen of it, it's a very interesting story. It, it does very much feed into the, the Greek myths, and it uses them very well. It, it, it really plunders from the Iliad. It really, really takes a, a lot from... And I, 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 I like the fact that it, it, it takes... Because it, it means it's more individualistic compared to a lot of other classic Doctor Who stories. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. more say science back? Yeah, it's, yes, yeah, yeah. Because previously, because because the initial run was kind of like the science trip and the history trip, and then the um, and then the kind of um, the bit where you got to Witcher video, you know, the sideways trip. Because um, yeah. you got you had the different forms of education through entertainment, so it was kind of done by stealth initially, right up until the series ended with the chase, and then it was um, this. This would have been one of the other ones, but it's interesting because it's played, it's played totally as 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 an historical, whereas um, it's not because it's myth. Um, but the other thing that's quite good about it as well is that all through it for the first three, you've got, um, you've got the Odysseus character being very big and, and large and hilarious. And he's really funny and, and he's a bit sinister, but you know, it's all okay. And then right at the end, you get this, it, it's almost like you get the rug pulled out from under you. And it turns out that he's, he's not, none of that has been funny at all he's he's very very dangerous and they've been in terrible trouble right the way through it and all the laughter has just been masking 
it's it's like it's a misunderstanding, and it, and it is a it's it's a very tragic, very very tragic thing, and it does end in a in a terribly upsetting way. I, I um, wonder if they one day might do a sequel with Peter Capaldi following Odysseus on on the Odyssey. Uh, that might be. <laughs> well, I think it would be obscure. I mean, I can't imagine like uh, tying the, the, new, laces and the new fans really getting mm. a lot of the references to yeah. one that was shown um, like <laughs> nearly. Um, Nearly 50 years ago, and it doesn't years ago, yeah. even exist at a soul anymore. Well, that's why they got away recycling one of my other choices as a new story. <clears throat> <laughs> well, um, this of course, Mythmakers has also got the departure of Vicky in it. Yes. Is, um, where she gets married. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is, um, you know, that happens a lot in Pleasant 2, where they'll get married to someone who they've only just met in that story. You yes. Know, you've got yeah. Leela, like, you've got... Um, yeah. Perry. Yeah. <coughs> to Brian Blessed. Brian Blessed. Well, Perry and Pete married. Why don't we move on to your second choice, which is again yeah. another another hard You might go in even longer for this one because it's like um <laughs> it's, it's a long story. It's it's a, well, it's a very long story, but it's one of the longest. I think it's yeah, like second longest. Second longest. Something like that. And it is a Dalek story. It is. And it is the Dalek Master Plan. It is. It is the Dalek Master Plan, which is the forgotten classic of Doctor Who. Security patrols five and seven will converge on this area. Priority alert: invaders to be located and destroyed. Um, going back to what you said about Vicky getting married off, though, it's quite interesting because, of course, Katarina comes on as a companion in this one. And you've got another couple of people who are regarded as companions, even though they aren't. You've got Brett Vine and... Well, you haven't got Brett Vine because he's not counted as a companion, but he should be. Oh. And Sarah Kingdom, who doesn't count, no matter how many adventures she didn't have in Mike Yates. And um, it's um, because um, I think it was Philip Sanderford suggested that initially, because with John Wiles wanting to give it maybe a... And uh, a much the, the series because he was putting his stamp on the series because of course Missions of the Unknown was the last Verity Lambert produced one so this is John Wiles taking over from you know this is this is sort of the this is a similar sort of situation to Barry Letts having planned Philip Hinchcliffe's first season and you get to see um, him and Robert Holmes putting a bit more darkness into it based you know based on the stories that they've been given well the Mythmakers and the Daleks Master Plan had, had pretty much been set rolling and the Daleks Master Plan had definitely been planned for quite some time prior to um, prior to them coming on because it's quite nasty that it's it's paced all right but at almost exactly the right point Dennis Spooner takes over uh, from Terry Nation and um, and it, and it's successful Der- Douglas Camfield directs it right the way through of course but there's a very good sense of there's a sense of jeopardy to it and there's a, there's there's that runs through it and it is kind of you know for, for a slow paced 12 parter it's it's nail biting stuff and there are elements within it that are very very clever because there's throwaway lines that then come back to haunt you later on and this is again pre pre video age and in some ways you know it's uh, because I'm going to have to do this. It's a little bit like um, like Breaking Bad in that uh, <laughs> it's got um, it's got lines that you that you don't even really notice that turn out to be important later on. It's got characters yeah. back like the monk, and most importantly of all, it doesn't fudge the ending without spoilers. It ends successfully. It pays off the preceding three months worth of wait by yeah. not by not destroying it and it's really good i i hope this one turns up because um i mean even the feast of stephen which you can skip if you like it is it is <laughs> but you know it's no different to any other sort of runaround that was going on at the time but but the feast of stephen's quite interesting because it's um partly it's the doctor and companions land in Z cars how familiar with the Daleks master plan are you, uh, Mr. Conrad? I'm I'm not very familiar. I mean, um, I mean, I'm, I'm more familiar with some of the Hartnell ones than I am with others because um, me and we have a friend who who did a marathon. Well, he's doing he's, one. He's, he's still he's, doing it. Well, he's, yeah, we don't know if he'll ever finish. <laughs> I think I think he, he's he's our age, but or around our age. He's a bit older, but. Um, I, think, uh, I mean, he's going to be at university before he gets onto like David Tennant. <laughs> so <laughs> we don't know how That's successful through the sensor rights. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know how successful it's going to be. But I mean, um, so because he was what he's been, he's obviously saw the Dark Monster plan. Uh, so 
So I'm more sort of a bit familiar with it, but I'm, I mean I've never seen it. Though I did try and I tried to listen to the audio for it because I did I did I do uh-huh. have the audio and, uh, oh, for right, quite right, a few. Right, fair enough, uh, Mr. Will. Oh yeah, I I've got the um, the episode uh-huh. on the Lost in Time the the ones that survived Lost in Time DVD, and I um, yes to help our friend I did watch some of the episodes with him, and it, it's 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 a very even with the um, the telescopes, it is an enjoyable story. There are some strange bits in it, like when the Doctor electrocutes Brett in the chair in the first episode. Yes, 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 yes. That is yes. slightly strange, you know, in it's, context with the character later on. He, he, well, yeah, because because he... Uh, he the, well, the character changes a lot anyway, doesn't he? Because, of course, um, this is... This is a, very quickly a point in which um, the character of the Doctor is in flux because uh, famously John Wiles really wanted to get rid of William Hartnell. Yeah. So um, I think probably there's an air of that running through some of the performance with it and some of the writing as well is, um, you know, this is, this is um, kind of what possibly, this is kind of the sort of the template for the for the Dalek series that Terry Nation never managed to get America to take up. We were supposed to be a pilot for that, wasn't it? And they were going to have um, mm. like this, yeah. the security service, or whatever it's called, from this in Space that, weren't unit. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they, yeah, they were going to be, because, yeah, it was going to be more kind of um, Brett Vine, a bit, a bit like sort of Danger Man, which is, you know, it would have been, it would have been fine, it would have been interesting. But, it would have been um, interesting, but I mean, it would have also meant we didn't have Dalek as not to anymore, so, you know, <laughs> yeah. Well, so, yes, but you know. Mm. <laughs> no. So, yeah. Your your third choice is another Dalek story. <laughs> but, I'm nothing if not system. But it's 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 a Dalek story. The another one that doesn't ex- that doesn't fully exist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. you, you don't get on to. You're not going to have many actual moving episodes, are you? You just have a lot of pictures until, until the, the choice after this, and it is Power of the Daleks. Power of the Daleks. Ben, do you remember what he said in the tracking room? Something about this old body of mine is wearing a bit thin. So he gets himself a new one? Well, yes. Power of the Daleks is, um, I think is, is uh, Daleks must be fantastic, you know, as, as, as kind of like um, galaxy wandering space operas go. It's, 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 it's beautiful. It's, it's marvellous. And there's some very great performances in it. But the power of the Daleks is not only it's a regeneration story. So it's, it's really important within the history. It's of the first one. It's the, Exactly. So it's got high stakes. It is. Yeah. Because yeah. And, and so no one really knows what's going on. It's the on. most important. If it had been got wrong then that would be it because, you know, they'd have thought, yeah. well, this redirection didn't work, let's just scrap it. Uh-huh. Yeah, because Doctor Who's walked on a knife edge through m- many of its years at many points, you know, that when it could have gone either way. It, it didn't become immortal probably until the Five Faces. So um, the Five Faces repeat season in 83, but um, it's 83 or was it 82? 82. But it was... Um, yeah, this 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 is an immensely important one. And what's something that's something that's really cool about it is that um, you've got David Whittaker writing it, and he writes the Daleks in a in a way which really annoyed Terry Nation <laughs> because because Terry Nation didn't get it. Um, so I, I can't off, I can't entirely remember the quote, but it was. Um, he didn't like having the Daleks being subservient because his idea was that because they were just robots, all you had to do was have him saying exterminate and you'd have got it made. And and it was kind of, well, you haven't really got what the Daleks were about then, which is a bit, a bit worrying, Mr. Nation. <laughs> because, um, you know, you supposedly invented them or was that Davros? It's, it's such a good story. Power of the Daleks. He's got some really immensely strong performances. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's gripping stuff, and it's really, it, it's it's a very, um, it's a very gutsy piece of drama in its own way, which sounds surprising when you're talking about the Daleks, but it's, um, it, again, it's quite harrowing and it's quite full on, and it and it, it it's a it's a treat to watch something you can actually get your teeth into, you know, and um, Christopher Barry's directing of it has got to. Uh, 
I think I'd be given credit because um, again, none, well, there's there's a, three or four shots of this survive, not much else, and it's a really, it's an amazing tour de force of a of a story. Um, how familiar are you with with this one apart from Victory of the Daleks, which doesn't count? <laughs> I've, I've, I've like seen a few clips. I mean, I've, I also have seen the remake, the one which the oh, yeah, yeah. did. The one that's not the remake. That's not Victory of the Daleks, but um, <laughs> the one with where they got Nicholas Briggs to do the Dalek voices on YouTube. And it oh yeah, from the BBC. Was that the one that got pulled recently? Yeah, that one. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was, that's weird. It's it's a good. That's, it's not a bad adaptation because you can see where they're coming from by just dropping. Um, a travelling salesman in, in in the place of the doctor. I, I know he wasn't a travelling salesman. I can't remember what he was doing. Who'd gone there to investigate it? And and this whole idea that this has been found and it's been planned. But I like the way the Daleks are really scheming and dangerous. They are actually dangerous. They're not. And Lesterson's slow descent into into despair and is wonderfully done. It's really good. Yeah, I'd massively yeah. recommend Power of the Daleks to anybody. Um, let's hope <laughs> it gets found. Yeah. Well, yeah, your fingers crossed. Yeah, that yeah would, I'd like to see that. That'd be great. Yeah. Because I always think the Daleks are at their best when they're sort of when when um, I would do like some of the like the big invasion ones. I mean, like Bad Wolf Part and other ways and stuff. But I mean, yeah. m- my favourite Dalek story is Dalek, and that's just oh. one Dalek, you know, on its own. And rather than having all these Daleks, all they're so powerful. And it's sort of with the Cybermen as well. I don't know, I think with most monsters they work better when they're like a couple of them just sort of uh-huh. having plans rather than a big army the emotion and the drama can be contained in a scene with two people and the two or, or three people you know like or, or uh, three people and one of them's a Zygon there you go and you don't mm. know yeah. which one and one of them's a Rutan you know and they're playing <laughs> poker that would be great there we are that's not a big finish maybe, maybe, maybe it could I mean. be a, a, a spin-off series <laughs> Zygons and Rutans playing poker. Sp- speaking of Rutans, your next choice involves the Rutans. I think uh-huh. it's quite obvious. Yeah. Which one it is? It is. Yes. Yeah. It's the. Uh, it's the. Um, it's the spin-off uh, computer game. It's not, of course. It's um, Horror of Fang Rock. Go into trouble then. Yes, I always find trouble. I'll oh, penalty, please. What about he's got? He's over there, dead. He's been dead some little time. Um, which kind of brings us, in some ways, to some of the reasons why I've made these choices now. Because Horror of Fang Rock, um, before, because um, I because I live in the Arctic now, and before I moved up here, I was um, I was sort of travelling up and visiting. And where I, the, the him who I write the blog with at that point was not, he was just reaching an age where he was able to um, watch Doctor Who without any kind of um, filter of cool and, and no sort of, um, there was no sneery attitude to it because it was still real. You know, the sets weren't wobbling, the acting wasn't strange. The uh, because of, because of the distance of time and the way that acting stars had, had moved on and editing, it wasn't slow paced. It was real and it was happening there, and so it was a real interesting thing to be able to watch it with someone who had a very pure sense of what the program was about, as opposed to watching it with my friends who were just snigger quite childishly rather than take it seriously. It was just amazing. And Horror of Fang Rock, um, I, it was one of these ones that I picked up on a VHS from a charity shop. Because I came, because I, I had a lot of time away from Doctor Who before, before I came back to it, and this was one of the ones that I picked up, and I thought, oh, I'll watch that with him, and and we watched it, and then another one we watched was Ark in Space, which scared the sense right out of him, but it's um because it's a really scary one, and it was that was good, but Horror of Fang Rock was the first one that we watched together, and watching it now is it it brings that back to me because although it was in the first season that I remember watching, cause I'm a thousand and three, it's got it, the, it, the, it, it's got a sort of a weird resonance to it. That, that, that it's, um, it's kind of like, it's not, it's odd. It's, it, you can't describe it as a kind of, it's like a time lapse of memory where everything just all shunts together thing and, and watching it with him and him being absolutely petrified. Cause it's a scary, scary, scary story. 
but that's that's why I chose that one rather than some of the more obvious ones like Brain of Morbius or Talons of Wang Chiang or even Genesis of the Daleks because to be honest mm. I'm sick to death of Daleks now but because uh, you know, we've already watched like months of them you know, I've got four months of Daleks in this already so yeah so I don't know what do you think of Horror of Fang Rotland guys? Um, this is going to be quite embarrassing I haven't seen it <laughs> I, 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 I think stories one I'd recommend you watch. I did. I, I'm. I think I'm pretty sure I've read the novelization for this, because uh-huh. when I was younger, uh-huh. like I, when I went down to the library, I wanted to read some not two books, and they didn't have that many. Uh-huh. And like they have, I've read all the new series like novels, and I want to read some sort of classic series stuff, and. Um, what someone at the library had like a collection of target novels and he agreed you know he said that he'd lend some of them to me okay. wow and it is one of the ones that I read and I can't really remember much about it but I, I, it was one of the ones I was, Terror of the Zygons was another one um, oh the Loch Ness Monster yeah <laughs> that was the first book I read <laughs> oh really yeah. yeah yeah it was the first book I read sorry comrade so the Horror of Fang Rock, the novelization, was it the one with, with the Doctor with this mad load of rope around his neck? I, I can't really remember. It would have been ages ago. Oh, you can't remember the cover? No, I can't remember the cover. It might have been that one. I, I, I don't remember much at all about it. I mean, I did remember enjoying it. Oh, right. It's I remember it, sort of, it was sort of tense. I like the ten, it was tense as the novel. I don't know it's, what it's like in the TV. It, 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 is, it is tense in the, the TV one. It's yeah, it's claustrophobic, isn't it? Because it's single. Yeah. There's no escape. Yeah. You're very conscious of where the door is, you know. And if there's something between you and the door, the only way is up. Yeah. Well, and literally. That, well, exactly. Case, yeah. Uh, right. So um, now so we'll go on to your next choice, which is one I have seen. So at least I can ah. talk about. It. I've seen all the ones. Yay. The ones so. <laughs> um, so we're, we're, we're past, past the halfway point now. And this one is a very good story, in my opinion. And obviously in your opinion as well, because yeah. you've chosen it. It's a Peter Davison story. Mm-hmm. It involves Cybermen. Uh-huh. Excellent. And it is Earthshock. Whoever's controlling the androids thinks there is. Destroy them. Destroy them at once. Let's have your opinions on it first, then. Uh, right, I'll go first, right? Yeah. I thought I, I really like this one. I, I I saw it like a while ago. And I've recently got the DVD and I've rewatched it. And before the um, actually before the 50th anniversary, I I rewatched a story from each Doctor and the yeah, one I chose. Five faces, didn't you? Yeah, like that, well, well, eleven. Eleven faces, and I I, I, the one I rewatched for Peter Davison was Earthshock. And ah, because, like, yeah. you know, I wanted it because we had another Cyberman one and I wanted another Cyberman. And, and I think this is Cyberman's one of their best appearances, second only probably to Tomb. Because mm. the Cybermen have, are, have, have always been a bit underused, I find, yeah. in a lot of their stories. Yeah. But Earthshock, because it is like a full force of them, but they are still, that is, it works. Because yeah. you, don't all, you don't see all of them at once, the sort of in shadows in like the freighter and they um and they seem unstoppable because like er, like people try and shoot them and they are like an unstoppable force and and it feels like there is like impending danger all the time it's sort of a bit like androzani or something like that where there's this sense of right something's going to happen and of course it does and the the, the shock that happens in the <laughs> From the title, which uh, there's not much of a spoiler to say that it's Adric's death, because I think uh. everyone knows that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you not know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, it's all right. There's an episode five. He's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh. I saw. I, I'm not a fan of Adric. Not many people are, but I I, I still think in that like, his like. Departure is was well played. I thought. Yeah. It's sort of tragic how, you know, he, he's sort of especially at the start where he's sort of saying he wants to leave. I mean, that's sort of always a sign that something's going to go wrong <laughs> right, when a companion yeah, says something like that. that. He says that in a lot of stories that he wants. To yeah. Leave. Oh, he, 
kept siding with the bad guys as well, so that probably didn't help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that's never a good sign for longevity or contract renewal. <laughs> it's a weird sort of one earth shock because um, I, I I was lucky enough to look a lot like Adric, you see, <clears throat> um, to the point where it was kind of oh look it's it's Al, but it but it wasn't. It was uh, Matthew Waterhouse, um, which is why you might have noticed that um, I appear in the Diddly Dumb promotional materials. Uh, as Adric, uh, because because I did look an awful lot like him. So it was only later on, you know, that I discovered that he was not quite as popular as uh, as I'd expected, which came as a bit of a shock because uh, you know I was blessed with <laughs> being his doppelganger, which was a right old treat. Um, but Earthshock was really was really clever because it was it was because it's basically it's alien you know for kids and um in its own in its own way it is this kind of unremitting violence and people being turned into pizzas but episode one is is um with snyder um getting melted that that that, that ep- the first episode is great because of course jnt had managed to jonathan turner had managed to keep um the cybermen off the cover and there was no mention of them in it so when you you reach when you when you've got through this really claustrophobic spelunking um you know um spelunking slasher type flick up till uh, you know the, the bit with the bomb when it suddenly closes in and you get david banks and simon giving you destroy them destroy them at once and you yeah. you, you know i didn't breathe for about half an hour after that it was awful <laughs> uh because it was such a because <gasps> of course i'd never seen the cybermen yeah, they'd never been on, and 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 they'd come back, and even though they'd redesigned them, you knew who they were straight away, and the Cybermen in it, they, like you said, they're supposed to be logical and emotional, but obviously they aren't, um, they just don't like meals, and um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's just... Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, these things are irrelevant. But it's uh, it's really um, it's a great one. And then of course Adric dies at the end. Well, apart from in part five, which he doesn't. But it's it's a, it was really shocking. And then when it when they ran the, I mean it's hilarious now. But when they ran the credits without any music and just a shot of the broken badge of mathematical excellence, um, it, that was that was. That, that got you know that was that was a defining moment of my childhood <laughs> which was a bit cheeky so yeah because now now it's it's much better with a laugh track but uh, there we go <laughs> see um i would have liked the only the only thing i that uh, the sort of i think of a shot that's disappointing is the fact that by the time obviously i went into it when we not when you had David Tennant on TV, so when I first found out about Earthshock, so the the, the, um, the secret was out about the Cybermen, and I would have liked to have been surprised that the Cybermen were in it when I watched it on DVD, but they're on the front cover of the DVD case, <laughs> so they weren't. <laughs> well, 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 marketing had taken over from surprise. Yeah, I think by then, every, much like more like most fans yeah, knew. Yeah. The worry about yeah. stories or anything. Stick a Cyberman yeah, so. on the cover. Forget about yeah. it. Well, it's, it's a bit like the... Um, it's a bit like the... Um, when the Dalek's like hybrid, I remember that That's appearing the on, on the front of Radio Times the week yeah. before. <laughs> I remember, I remember getting that. That's weird to think that was bloody... That was over seven years ago. I, I feel so old. <laughs> well, that, that makes me feel, but... <laughs> Because earlier on, we got uh, earlier on there was a tweet saying Utopia was seven years ago today, and I, I remember like the, when the master was in it and oh, yeah. it was going crazy. <laughs> also yeah. made a point that Derek Jacobi, even though he's one of the only gay, he's the only gay actor to play the master, he's the least camp out of the ones <laughs> who play the master. <laughs> well, yes, yeah. Um, oh, blimey, yes. Because let's not talk about. Julia Roberts' brother, shall we? Okay. Well, actually, referring to the master, he he plays quite a big part in your next choice. Oh, nice segue. He does. He does. <laughs> yeah, he does. He plays quite. A, he's also a Peter Davison story, and it's 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 sort of like a, a re, it's a well, it's a it's a reunion episode, uh, an anniversary episode. Of, the gang's all back together. And it's the one that's been chosen before for this podcast. Yeah. Yes. And it is the five doctors, though there's only four, really. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a well, only three, really. <laughs> well, yeah, only three, really. <laughs> to lose is to win, and he who wins shall lose. I know what it says. What does it mean? It also promises that whoever takes the ring from Rassilon's hand and puts it on shall get the reward he seeks. Right, anyway, as I know, I've mentioned before on the podcast that The Five Doctors was the um, first story I ever saw of the classic series. Uh huh, that's right. So, um, yes, yeah, so I've sort of got a sort of a sentimental attachment to this story. Mm. And like, yeah. I sort of, because my DVD, I haven't mentioned this on the last time, so it's sort of new, but <laughs> new information for the listeners. But my DVD got stuck on the bit where um, the first Doctor walks into the the big chamber and goes, da da! They kept playing that over and over again. It was really annoying. <laughs> Did you think it was just immensely avant-garde and a very brave decision at the yeah, time? Yeah, I, I did at first, and I sort of thought, no, no way, hold on, let's clean this. Is um, chronic hysteresis? Oh no, no, it's a thumbprint. <laughs> I just thought it was like a time loop or something. A time loop. It's stopped in there. But yeah, I mean, time. I mean her, her, her was my first... First, first person I saw, the first time I saw the first Doctor, and it would have been that for quite a lot of fans, I suppose. He would have been your first, first Doctor. Yeah. First Doctor. First first first. Well, that's not totally true, is it? Because... Oh, he, William Hart does appear at the Stuts Me in the little clip. Yeah. Because yeah. I was, I was going to agree with you then, but but I can't really, because... <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, yeah. I Because like, I, I've chosen this one for a sentimental reason, largely, because I remember... Because um, we'd only just got a video recorder, uh, which at that point um, they were they were more expensive. It was like having a second home, you know, and um, <laughs> it was. And uh, this I'd recorded um, this off the Children in Need broadcast. So that bit that you've got with the um, with the repeating dun 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 dun, leading into the wonderful easiest pie moment, as easy as pie. That whole scene had um, little messages about who'd been sitting in beans in which part of the country and telephone mm-hmm. numbers to ring and sort of like what was going on there. And it was it was really quite it was quite interesting. And disappointingly, not on either of the DVD releases. Uh, <laughs> could have been a special feature, couldn't it? Yeah, I th- it could have been like the info text you just had on children in need stuff. But um, this has got a big sentimental value f- for me because I because the, the video I recorded was was at my dad's and um, my dad had got tickets without sort of telling me about it to Longleat. Oh. Um, so I I went to the you know I went I went along to Longleat for the twentieth and I met Peter Davison and. Um, and I met um, Sarah Sutton, and they signed my copy of the visitation. And and, and uh, other than that, I did a lot of queuing and took some photos that didn't come out. But that's about it, you know. But it was, but it was, a, you know, it's a vitally important thing to. Uh, there's a photo of me. Um, uh, st- I'm obviously um, stealing Tom Spilsbury's position, and and because um, there's a photo of him in one of the warp warps, standing in front of the TARDIS with a couple of cosplayers around him. And I got a photo of me doing that. And there's a photo of me sat in Bessie, looking miserable. Um, this was around the time when I looked slightly less like Adric and more like Ash. From Pokemon fame because I really do look you know, like um, anyway. No, that's another story. But it was uh, yeah. So I picked that one for sentimental value, and also because it covers all of the doctors. Because I wanted to cover. Because on this desert island, I'm not going to have any John Pertwee, um, and I'm not you know, which is um, which is all right because John Pertwee, you know. If I'm going to have a John Pertwee one, I'd rather have one that kind of covers as much of the series as possible. So. And and I like and the five doctors is it's it's yeah you know it's it, it, mm, I'll shush now. <laughs> um, now you don't manage to get all the doctors on because we, got, we skip past Colin Baker as everyone else has done, um, and um, it's, it's skip Sylvester McCoy yeah. and, and um, skip I'm, the I'm movie. Paul. TV well, movie. Movie yeah, no one's chosen the movie. I feel sad for Paul. I've really gone for things that trigger, you know, that do trigger kind of like a like a gut response for whatever reason. Yeah. And, and you're going to get that with the next one. Okay. So, yeah. So your um, next story is in fact a Christopher Eccleston story. I think you're the yeah. first person to pick a Christopher Eccleston story. He's my, yeah. he's my doctor, as it were, the first one I saw. Uh huh. Um, the episode you've chosen is the end of the world. But you never take time to imagine the impossible. And maybe you survive. This is the year 5.5 slash apple slash 26. Five billion years in your future. I 
I, I don't, not sure if I saw this one on broadcast. <laughs> our, our friend, our friend who um, is doing the marathon, he saw it on broadcast when he was very much younger with his dad, and he 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 says this story rather ashamedly now. He he said, "Oh, but it's not as good as Star Wars because he's a big Star Wars fan." He still um, is a big Star Wars he's fan, still, wait, he's but he's also a big Wars, fan of Doctor Who, especially Chris Eccleston. Yeah, especially Chris Eccleston. He's wrong as well. <laughs> so so he, he he tells that story rather ashamedly that he when he first saw Doctor Who, it was the end of the world, and he thought it was rubbish because it wasn't Star Wars, and yeah. It kind of <laughs> is Star Wars, but you got the, all the, well, the yeah. many aliens. You got the many aliens. <laughs> no, I do. I enjoy the end of the world. I mean. What, um, what's the sentimental reason you've chosen this? Well, this is a straight... Well, now, there's, there's a few reasons around this one, because this is weird, because um, cause I'm from Cardiff. So, yeah, no, the end of the world, right, because this, this was a really weird point. So this was shown 2nd of April in 2005, and Doctor Who had come back after this long hiatus of just not being on, and I'd... And it was being filmed in Cardiff, and, and for the sort of, like, the previous year, there'd been weird stuff going on you know you'd be walking through the middle of cardiff and streets would be blocked off and there'd be loads and loads of um, outside broadcast fans around and no one really had a clue what it was about because i wasn't into dog and i wasn't online so i didn't know what was happening and then um just about the time that um, rose came out i had decided that i was going to be moving from cardiff to the arctic and i was going to be moving on the first of july which is 12 days after um uh part of the ways so um, the whole of the Christopher Eccleston series, so, so what, had, what was actually, you know, although it's not the best television series of all time, it's my favourite television series, had returned. It was being filmed in my hometown. So all the way through watching it, I had to watch each episode twice in order to be able to sort of, you know, go, you know, oh, I work there or, you know, I, I, I um, yeah, I work there. I won't go into too much detail. And... Uh, um, it, just to get past that sort of side, you know, that, that, that weird, because it wasn't London. It was obviously, you know, the back of the St. David Centre or it wasn't, it, it, it was, a, that's, that's where I, thousands of years ago, I did, I did a band photograph there, you know, and it was, it was really, it was a very, very strange sense of, Day job, uh, of to, to have. Yeah, yeah, it was very weird. Um, and it was, it was, it, it felt oddly you know, I mean, we read too much into these things, and it's all apophenia, but it's wonderful. And the um, the other thing that with this with this uh, with this series was that there's this countdown going on because I knew that I was going to be moving away. But also, two years prior to that, I'd not only given up meat, I'd stopped watching television because I was sick to death of it. So I didn't have um, an actual television, so I couldn't watch these as they were going out. But I was friends with someone who had a flat nearby and we'd go round and watch his recording of it so i didn't see it live as it went out but i was up in the arctic for the broadcast of end of the world and this was about six or seven months after i'd watched horror fan rock with him and although there'd been broadcasts on um, uk gold on sunday mornings and he'd he'd um he he must have watched Brain and Morbius by himself because we hadn't seen it together. But that's one of his one of his earliest memories is of a mutt um, being decapitated, which I think is a very healthy thing for a child to uh, have as a as a as an early sort of memory, um, especially with some of the dialogue coming in and the glorious Philip Maddock, whoever he may be. And so, but the end of the world, we watched it together and we watched it as it was broadcast, and that was the first thing that I watched with him and as it was being shown and all I think there's only one other episode of Doctor Who that we've watched as it's being broadcast and that's one of the other ones that's the last one that I've chosen because end of the world it's not it's not terrific but that is why that's why I've got that because the memory that's just it's because I missed Unquiet Dead because I was on a I was on a train um, you know, after doing all the uh, of the helicopter business to come out of the the Arctic, um, I was yeah. on I was on a train back down to Cardiff, so I missed Unquiet Dead. But that one, I sat down and I watched with him as it went out, and it's it's an immensely that's another immensely important part of my life, and hopefully his, you know. But so so so, we, so he's more for sentimental reasons as opposed to the actual content of the episode. Not that the oh episode yeah, it's is mid. bad, but the episode <laughs> it's is bad. Like... The episode's good. I've, I've got nothing against the episode. <laughs> No, I'm kidding. Yeah, no, it's a good one. And it was really, you know, after Rose, which did what it needed to do, fair, you know, fair play to him for 
that's just for pulling a Barry Letts and blowing all the budget straight away. It's just like, bang, there we go. That's just it. And from now on, we'll have lots well, they, of talking. They did want to show, like, everything a new Doctor Who could do, because I suppose Rose was more, you know, like, like the shop window dummies and sort of, you know, you didn't see any really a- real alien creatures. At the end of the world, was the first time you saw alien creatures, and there's a lot of them. <laughs> there's, a, there's a heck of a lot. A heck of them. And, and also, uh, one of the most alien creatures is, in fact, the human. I think that's it's inter- that's sort of an interesting thing, Don't, that, that yeah. the last human has become so dehumanised. And so and lost so every- alien. So alien. Yeah, so alien. And like... You see, the Doctor, even though we know him to be an alien, is sort of more human, even though he does let her die. <laughs> is, yeah, but about, because, because even the trees are more human, aren't they? Than even what the trees, yeah, you sort of, even the trees and like the the um, the blue people there, they're, they're yeah. sort of you relate more to them than the actual, you know, descendant. You know, what would be your own species, and yeah. you know, usually on any uh, Doctor Who planet, you'll relate to the human. You know, because mm. you know. You know, it's your species, and you know, they think, oh, well, they look, look like me. But they, she doesn't even look human. She is, like, just skin. And it's sort of showing, like, how, you know, you got to, you don't don't keep lose sight of what's important, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, don't yeah. lose your humanity for cosmetic purposes. Yeah. Uh, your next choice is <laughs> another anniversary story. And it, it is, it's, it's also, as you mentioned, the... Um, other story we watched with uh, him. It uh-huh. is the day of the Doctor. It's a uh, uh, timey wimey thing. Timey what? Timey wimey? I've I've no idea where he picks that stuff up. It is, and this was this this kind of um, squares a circle for me um, because the. Um, uh, as as with everybody, you know, austerity has bitten down and times are tight. And I I wanted to see this, and I wanted to do something special with it. And the tickets for the um, the tickets for the the, the the sort of the official convention in London had sold out. You know, not quite as fast as Monty Python and Kate Bush did, but in a you know pretty quick. And so there was just no chance of of, get, of getting the tickets to see it. And like I say, I don't watch telly as live. And then when I found out that it was being shown in, you know, cinemas, you know, as broadcast in 3D, it was a bit, it was something that I just felt, well, the last time anything like this sort of happened was Longley. And it's, you know, it's a moment where fandom, you know, it, it becomes a collective experience. It becomes a sort of a, a, a you know, a, a, a group it, it's it's difficult to explain without sounding like a fool and also like a bit of a hippie, but it would it would be a group experience and a kind of like a moment of of yeah. It's like going know, to a gig, I, isn't it? I know, yeah, 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 yeah. I know what you mean. I know yeah. what you mean. Um, see, that's <laughs> the odd thing. That's the reason I didn't watch Day of the Doctor in the cinema. I mean, my, my local cinema did show it in three D, but I I I. I, I Prefer to see. I thought I would prefer to see it on my. I I didn't want to ri- any risk from like the like it being ruined. I didn't want like someone People screaming behind me or, and, or and like. Um, I would. I I would like to see it in 3D though, because I didn't think the 3D would would really matter as much. Uh-huh. But it, obviously it did because it, you know you know the the painting. It was, it was good. Word but the other thing is, what, what you've got to think about is the people, the people who are going to pay, because uh, in the end, it was announced sort of on the Monday, the tickets will be on sale at half past nine in the morning on the, on the Friday. And I knew it was just going to be a nightmare getting hold of the tickets because they were just going to sell really fast because people would be jumping on it. Um, but the only way I was going to be able to do it was was cash was in cash you know uh, so i wasn't gonna be able to do it over the phone so i'd actually have to go down and go and get them when it opened and i was sweating because i queued up in the rain me and two other people <laughs> to get these tickets that people have been going on about online because it um that people in australia have been paying something like um you know over a hundred dollars for three tickets and it had all gone on sale early and i was just panicking that it was going to have sold out and it would have been massively disappointed but i managed to get the tickets for it because i was working on the basis that i knew it was going to be so expensive that people weren't going to take their kids 
the only people who were going to go and see that would be at least as nerdy as me about the fact that you're going to go and see Doctor Who in the cinema because it's an experience. So, so I knew it was going to be fine, and it was. Um, and it was, it was actually, it was quite good because we were there a bit early. Um, I've written it all up in tedious length on the blog, so there you go. I've, I've, I've probably got to say that. But um, it's, it was, um, it was really, it was a collective thing, and um, a couple of, you know, the, the, people laughed in the right places because they got the jokes. You know, there was a cheer when when Tom Baker turned up. Spoilers, and there were oh no, he did it in advance, didn't he? He said he was in it, so that's okay. That's yeah. not a spoiler. Yeah, and spoiler um, himself. <laughs> yeah, and you and it it was a roar when um, when Peter Capaldi's eyebrows made their appearance because um, he's a bit of a local boy in the Arctic. So I was just glad that, that that we'd managed to do it and that we'd. It was another group collective moment, and I'm not really into. It was something, and you know, fair play to Stephen Moffat. He did a he did a good job with that one. How am I going to eat, guys, on this on this desert island? Has it got <laughs> seagull? I am vegetarian. Has it got coconuts? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have coconuts. It'll have like It'll have vegetation. Water. <laughs> you, can, you can eat water. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, the, the, you know, you'll probably be able to have a a bookcase to put all the DVDs on and yeah. TV and, and, yeah, well, and, and, and uh, TV and, yeah, yeah, and uh, <laughs> an aerial because otherwise it'd be just quite annoying just what can I do with these you don't <laughs> use them just to like <laughs> knock a coconut off the tree or something well, it's been so a bit throw cheap, like, the like, ice warriors at, uh, at the tree and get food yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, you've one of the things you can choose is a book, and you don't need anything else to play a book, of course. Um, <laughs> and the book you have chosen, yeah, is Dragon's Claw. It is. It's, yes. uh, it's Dragon's Claw. Yeah. Oh. Which is the um, it's the collected because I was a bit cheeky because um, I thought that um, Iron Legion was a bit obvious because uh, I I like. <laughs> well, I don't just like my comics. I think comics are a vastly underrated art form. They're not a genre. <laughs> so let's not go into that. But yeah, they're the reprints of the um, of um, the old Doctor Who weekly. Uh, um, it's, I think it's issue thirty nine to about sixty. So back when it still counts. And it's um, it's Steve Moore um, who you know died quite recently, which is which is a shame. An immensely important writer, Steve Moore and Steve Parkhouse. It's the start of Steve Parkhouse's run, and Steve Parkhouse is probably the best writer who's ever worked on it uh although steve moore gave him a fair run and and um and it's, it's dave gibbons art throughout uh and of course dave gibbons goes on to do things like watchmen and but you know he would create in road trooper but it, but this was although i was reading books i i really learned to read more through comics and th- these because it, i was uh, it, during that sort of formative stage these were immensely important things to me and it wasn't just doctor who that i was reading i was reading 2000 ad and things and by you know uh, and and warrior and and stuff like that because warrior was coming out when i was about 10 and I, I was reading it but the the whole run of of dragon's claw uh the, the the run of the run of strips within it are immensely influential on the new series of doctor who to the to the fact that you can see you can see ideas and you know, cropping up within it and um and callbacks and echoes and there, there's, there's references to it as well cronk burgers um not from dragon's claw they, they run in the um Iron Legion volume, but they're still they're still there, and it and Tides of Time was the greatest Doctor Who story outside of the series, and you know none of it counts. Obviously, it's just a nice piece of comics history, but um, they are really are magnificent. If you get the chance, if you haven't read them, if you get the chance to read them, you should really treat yourself because that they, they're Doctor Who comics that are so it doesn't matter. You know, it's not can it doesn't count. It doesn't matter. It's as valid as anything you've written in the back of your exercise book. And that's it. And that's all. That's all yeah. it is. It's all fan fiction, and it's great. And you know, good luck to people for producing it, and good luck to people who want to read it, and good luck to people. I think it's wonderful. It's it's nice that it's all out there, but it's all apocryphal and it doesn't count. As long as we know that, then that's fine. But here is something like, that that I think does on. count. <laughs> is is your this, next this is definitely canon. Well, you did try and sneak it in as an episode, not I vetoed it. If Night of the Doctor counts, which it obviously doesn't because it's a DVD extra, then this one counts. Yeah, it's that's canon. what I was just going to say. The, 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 this counts, and it's it's a VHS from the 1990s, and it is Tom Baker 
the rather the Tom Baker years VHS. It, it, it counts as canon. We, we can officially say that here and now. <laughs> Good, because it, it's like, um, because not only does it cover everything, well, it's basically, it's it's the Doctor as Tom Baker talking about all of the, you know, as talking about all of the, all of the different, uh, well, not remembering any of the stories that he's been in, in order, which is great, but occasionally coming out with, I remember the pub, which is a great bit, but um, it's just... Because Tom Baker was my doctor. Because it's terrific. And because it is the doctor. Because of all the actors who've played the doctor, you've got actors who've played the doctor. But really, it's the doctor enjoying who's, who's, whose eyes he's looking out through at that particular time. And Tom Baker was the nearest human being to encapsulate whatever it is within that. And you could see him staring at you and going, you know, like, well, I remember the name of the pub, as I said previously. But it is. And, it, and the whole thing. And it's an immensely moving piece and you see the highs and the lows and the oh guys if you can find it because it's, mer- it's yeah, really it's very expensive. difficult to i don't even have yeah. a, being a, 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 a modern person i don't have a vhs <laughs> player not a working one anyway not in the house yeah. i mean tom baker is kind of the because i mean like when you see david tennant or someone being interviewed outside the show you know mm-hmm. it, it's it's the actor david tennant like, it's, yeah, it's, it's literally not, like a, a like, you know, it's normal down to earth bloke. If you see Tom Baker being interviewed outside, you know, Tom Baker's still. like, you still see it as the doctor. You know, that's all he is. And it, I, I think he sort of still sees it a bit as the doctor. Because he, the, they says, oh, are you surprised to still be playing the doctor? And he said, well, I never stopped playing the doctor. Thing is, I was playing the doctor before I got the part. And after I played the doctor, <laughs> everything I did afterwards, I played like the doctor because otherwise there's no point. He's right, though. I think he's. I think he's one of the actors who's really got it. And also, I you say no. you're saying on about the um, when he's watching it, he says he couldn't really remember anything about yeah. the stories. In the the, the, the this thing, it says that um, he didn't know what the scene was about for, for um, Day of the Doctor. But then I never used to know what it was about. <laughs> <laughs> he just didn't did it, but he still got it um, so right. Yeah. Oh, he's amazing. Yeah, he really Tom Baker. Yeah, he living is. legend. <laughs> Very much so. So, should we wrap it up there? Yeah. <laughs> we probably better had. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, well, thank you for having me, gentlemen. Yeah. it's been it's been oh, a lot of fun. And pleasure. of course, we will will have another episode coming very shortly from one of your fellow hosts. In fact, your both of your fellow hosts of Diddly Dumb are doing yeah. episodes of this podcast. Two so you have, that to, you have look that to look forward to. So, um, anyway, um, thank you all for listening, and I'll see yeah. you next time.